And this is the first of a series of six talks on the compound nature of the human being. And because of the factors involved all the way along, I make a sort of a preamble out of this, setting the foundation as it was more or less delayed for us by, by Paracelsus von Hohenheim. According to Paracelsus, there are two books, the great book of the universe and the little book, which is man. To uh, Paracelsus and many other physicians of that early period, the human body was the most available text for the whole world, for all the things that happen everywhere, anytime. Because somewhere within the microcosm, which is man, all the processes of the macrocosm are unfolded. George Gallup, the man who did the Gallup poll and was a great assembler of information, said that to him it was utterly inconceivable that the amount of information in the human body is available to measure every other mystery of the universe. We have lived with this body to find it mostly creaky and a little uncertain and do not realize the tremendous scope of wonders that are taught by the body to help us to chart the universe and all of its processes. It was, of course, Paracelsus who declared that there were three parts to the human body as there are three parts to the world. There is the spiritual part, the invisible causal nature. There is the lower part, the body. The physical form which also exists is to be found and be found throughout nature. And between these two, the man and the space, there is a middle distance which has been in talk called the mind or the reasoning faculty. So man is spirit, mind, soul, and body. The universe is spirit, mind, soul, and body. And these departments or divisions were the basis of most ancient reasoning and reckoning. But there's an interesting point here that I don't think anyone is making. I've never seen it made, and I've never seen any real definite effort to understand it in the large and uh, important terms with which it can be involved. Actually, there are two functions in man that we have to consider, thought and memory. The individual is the thinker who remembers. Now, this is very so ordinary and sounds very simple, but it is the source of infinite confusion. The thinker is an entirely different function of the compound human being from the digester or memorizer. All memorized facts are static. All facts which arise from the direct observation of realities are, we say, active. Now, the uh, development of the uh, memory has to a great degree burdened mankind from the beginning of time. We are depending more and more upon what we remember and less and less about the original thinking of which we are capable. The thinking is an active process. Whatever is thought may be later recorded and put on paper or on a cylinder or stored away in the memory. Memory is a storehouse, but it has very little use unless there's something to store in it. And this has been where the weakness has been in our modern thinking. When we go back to the ancients, when the life was comparatively simple and the carvings on the walls of caves were about all the records we had, the factor of thought was much more dynamic than it is today because the natives of that time had no memories to fall back upon. There was no previous history of the world in which he lived. There was no previous account of the adventures of others like himself, because he had no record and no written form to tell him what to do in an emergency. He was gradually forced to a very positive position. He had to think. 
he had to try to find the answers for himself by himself. He had to try to figure out what to do when the cave bear attacked him. He had to find out what to do when he was stricken with an ailment or suffered from an accident. These things could, no, could not be taken out of books. He could not consult a physician. He knew no way to function except through his own personal initiative. He had one, however, one factor in his favor. He was capable of an intimate and immediate uh, religious reaction. Not knowing what to do and how, where to find help, he called upon the deities or upon the spirits or upon the mysteries of the air to give him advice. And out of this we have the seers and the sibyls, those who sought to lead the individual in ways of thoughtfulness before the individual was really doing any basic thoughtfulness for himself. Therefore we have thought, which is the process of examination, and we have memory. Now if we apply this to the human body, we will find that the thought is still working in the laboratory, and the other, the memory, is in hundreds of volumes of recorded research. Now these hundreds of volumes sound very, very important. But one of the things we have discovered in the course of time is that all these volumes put together do not give us the immediate answers that we want for the problems of daily living. We have got to think today in order to survive. And all the books in the world cannot bestow salvation upon us because these books are memories. Memories that come and arise from the past and our problems arise right now here. We have to use new agencies of thought. We have to use the mind as we have never used it before if we want to solve the problems of our time. The only thing that memory can bestow is a certain amount of consolation, a, a, lead, a lead or two, as to where in the past something similar may have occurred. But if we go back to that past when that something may have occurred, we will find the situation so basically difficult and different that we do not find the answer there that we are seeking now. Science, therefore, is a great recorder of knowledge. But in the last analysis, Science is also hopelessly dependent upon original thought. And thought is the problem that we are all working with very closely and very sincerely today. Now let's see what this all means in terms of the human being. We know the individual, everyone living in this world, has the capacity to think. And to think is to give a, an expression to a basic mental principle within ourselves. This basic mental principle is not infallible. It does not mean that we can forget everything else simply by thinking, but it means that this mental faculty is indispensable in an effort to understand the physical phenomena of life. It cannot solve problems beyond itself, but it is very necessary to achieve the immediate information we need for daily living. So we try to figure out how we shall do some original thinking. Now original thinking means that we have to have a disciplined mind. It cannot drift around in the vagaries of uncertainty. We cannot have a mind laden with superstition and expect it to serve us in time of emergency. There is tremendous importance, therefore, in mental training, the mental organization, and the preparation through education of the mind for the responsibilities of personal decision. In the uh, present educational system, we have virtually no mental training. In there, we are depending upon textbooks, which are nothing but memory. They're what somebody else said long ago. And we live that to the children of today and expect them to find the answers to their problems. These answers are not there. They are in spirit, perhaps, or in substance, or in symbolism, partly expressed. But the average young person today does not know how to take 
memories and transform them into dynamic, immediate decisions. Now, <clears throat> working with this problem and working with the memory factor that is so very, very important, we then come to an a very interesting and I think very profitable conclusion. Today, we are working to get our way out of a complica complicated situation. We are seeking more and more answers to the basic problems of life. So what have we done? We have finally, to crown everything else, invented a computer. And what is a computer? It is nothing but a mechanical memory. A, you, you, a computer cannot answer any question that has not already been answered. It cannot come to any conclusion which cannot be gained or brought back from previous conclusions. The, the uh, computer is not a thinker. It is a rememberer. We can put great volumes of statistics into the computer and they will come out in a much more orderly way. But all the computers in the world will not teach us how to get out of debt because it cannot create thought. It cannot take ideas and transform them into immediate active reality. It can give us all kinds of hunches and suggestions and opinions and beliefs, but they are all based upon something that was known before, something that existed in the time when the Chinese were shaking their oracle bones. So we have here a new way of remembering and it probably was going to take over very heavily our educational system. But what we, when, we, when it has done this, what are we going to have? Are we actually going to have an answer to anything other than maybe a more efficient way of doing something we've been doing all the time? We cannot expect the computer to think. And we laughingly believe that it thinks. We like to hope that it could think. Because if it could only think for us, we might be out of trouble. Because we've never been able to think for ourselves. And this is always a rather disillusioning and discouraging discovery. But at the present time, we are very carefully educating people for the problems of computerization. We are going to be able to feed all kinds of facts into the instrument. And it's going to come out with all kinds of answers. But these answers are not going to be beyond the sphere of the physical information that we pour, can pour into the computer. Now, if we pour it into the computer, all that we know about man, we probably would come out with some rather complicated findings. We would realize that probably no, none of us have ever thought of all that is thinkable about the human state. We would also find a certain number of facts which are in themselves very important. Facts have to be there. But facts are also static unless the mind renders them dynamic. Dynamic. The mind has to put life into facts. It has to take the fact and use it to accomplish a specific purpose or the fact is not useful. So we can get all kinds of facts. For instance, we can be told oh, by a computer that we should love each other, but that does not end war. We can be told by the computer that it is perfectly possible to do a better job at bookkeeping than we do now. This can be accepted and will prove to be true. So we will accept the fact about the bookkeeping, but we know that we have no answer about the war. All of these things remind us that no instrument that man develops on himself can be more enlightened than the person that develops it. And that also, in this case, that we are developing in the study of the human body, its anatomy, physiology, and functions, a great deal of information that can be very valuable to us. But if this valuable information is simply fed into an instrument, it will come out with no more answers than perhaps the Aborigines had long ago, because there is no solution in merely finding the answers that are already there. But of course, there are always some, if there are some answers to problems we haven't thought much about, we might get some secondary information. But the primary problem of where we're going from here has to be mastered by the mystery of the mind itself and not by any form 
of computerization or the regimentation of knowledge in uh, retrospect or in anticipation. We are therefore right now on the problem of, spec of looking at the human body as it was looked at by those long ago. There was a time when our actual information was very limited. Therefore, all knowledge had to be from experience. The individual in a little tribe of a half a dozen natives somewhere in the valley of the Rhone uh, had to live the best he could in a cave with a stone axe. Everything that happened to him was very real, very definite, and very consecutive. He did not know how to solve these problems, but it gradually dawned upon him that there had to be an answer. And the first answers that he thought of were religious. He thought that somewhere there was a spirit or a god or a soul or something that was available to him in a great emergency. And he was in a great emergency all the time. So that he had to constantly beseech this power, whatever it was, or however it worked, to help him. Now, he didn't know at that time, however, of uh, what you might say is positive thinking. We use positive thinking a great deal to solve problems these days. And he did it, but he didn't know it. His positive thinking was to think there was something better than he was that could take care of him. He didn't think he could do it for himself, but he thought it could be done. And that began the development of theologies and philosophies and moral systems. They were all part of man's desperate determination to answer the hurt that he had today. He could remember the hurts of yesterday and what caused them. That might prevent him from repeating the hurt. But in the history of civilization, the repetitions of hurt have seldom have ever been identical. And the man who had a hurt a week ago learned something from it may get no helpful information from another hurt today or next week. Each situation is a complete problem in itself. And the only uh, way to meet the complete problem of mankind is by the complete use of the faculties which we have been given to solve problems with. Now, in our first talk of this uh, series, the problems we are discussing are physical. They will come very well, therefore, under the general heading of science. And we know from the history of science several things that are important. We get a hint from about science from, uh, from tradition, from memory. Memory, if we look, it up, if we look up science in the dictionary, we find out what the memory of science is. And we find out what it was supposed to do, how it was supposed to do it, and what its best conclusions were. Now, these conclusions may not be too good, and many of them will have to be rejected, and many of them have been completely contradicted. But there are some that have stood the weight in time of years. And these we have to study in terms of scientific. But the moment we come to a scientific problem, then we have to turn it over to the mind. Because no scientific problem is completely solved. It is in some form of being solved. Or it is being rejected as not possibly to be solved. But anyway, we'll assume that the mind takes over the problem. Now, it can then immediately look it up in the best book on the subject, and will then find the memory of that problem. It will find the memory of the Spanish Inquisition. It will find the memory of the Crusades. It will remind us of the wars that have gone, the great wars of Aquila and Alaric. It will teach us a little bit about the Charlemagne and Napoleon, and Hitler, and Mussolini, and Stalin. And it will give us a very interesting cross-section of all these things. But what we're really lead, reading is memories. Therefore, we can find out what, what happened, but memory cannot tell us what to do about it. Memory can only recall that this was an outrage, and this was a terrible thing. We've had those kind of answers for centuries. In the present uh, century, we have had the two worst wars in history. And behind this, it's over 3,000 years of records of these things, uh, but still no solution. We know, for instance, that uh, war is what it is. But how to do something about it? So today, the 
foremost nations of the world are trying to figure out what to do about it. And their first job has been to go back into the memory bank and see what was there and to find out why these things happened. And they, with the aid of the memory bank, they have found out what happened and why and how it happened. But it ends as a statistic. There is nothing in the memory bank that can give them a clear vision of, of solution. The memory bank may be morally informative. It may just tell us all that we shouldn't fight. But this doesn't solve the problem. We also have the consideration of that from memory uh, of all the various experiments that we try in daily living, our paying bills, whether we live within our means, and all these things are in the memory bank. But when it comes to daily life, we more or less ignore that. We do not learn from experience. Uh, we keep right on trying to do it our way. We can read from the memory bank of other people, as in the case of narcotics addiction, and find out what it does, but it does not prevent us from turning in our turn to the same vices and devices. So there's a great problem all now of trying to find out some of the facts about the human being. Facts that were amazingly understood long ago. Understood at a time when there was no way, there was no way of simply reading your way into a solution. There were ancient writings. There were books on anatomy and physiology in Egypt 4,000 years ago. Even if we could find them all, we'd probably pay no attention to them because they belong to another generation, another world, another time. But they represent the memory bank of how to keep the peace. But all the memories in the world will not keep the peace for the reason the ambition of the individual is as so too, far too powerful to answer and to respect these discoveries. So the mind must step in and work with the material and must also add to the memory of the past, the experience of now. The mind, therefore, has to work with now. And now, in some way, never quite fits the past. It never quite solves the mysteries of the past. And the mysteries of the past never quite solve the modern problem. The nearest we can gain a moral solution is ethics, which will contribute something. But most people are unwilling to live according to it. Now from the human body we gain a whole group of interesting facts. Uh, as I, I said, Paracelsus says that there are three parts to the mystery of man. Man as a ca causal spiritual being, man as an intellectual individual, and man as a physical body. These three correspond to the three worlds recognized by ancient antiquity, heaven, earth, and hell. And uh, the uh, Rosicrucian author, Flood, made a very good study of this particular point. He shows that for uh, the comparison that the, the skull uh, seated upon the uh, anchor br uh, bridge of the neck represents in this uh, point the intellectual center. The physical center is in the physical body, it surrounds the heart and the, and the most vital organs. The com combination or uni union of the two is corresponding uh, with the development of the autonomic nervous system and the upper part of the body. So we have heaven, earth, and hell as brain, heart, and physical abdominal structure. In these Rosicrucian studies, Flood shows a picture of the abdominal cavity, which he describes as hell. And uh, maybe that is the reason why so many uh, individuals have considered our food projects and our food habits to be one of the greatest enemies that we have. The individual lies first in the abdominal cavity by the misuse of its function and by the abuse of its principles. The problem of taking care of that, however, is largely a problem of justice. The individual will find out gradually that nothing he ignores will do him any good. 
he cannot think himself out of an action and get anywhere. He cannot forget something he doesn't want to remember and come through in perfect condition. He must recognize that the human body has its requirements. And these requirements on their own plane are the same as the requirements of a nation, of the planet, and of the solar system. Everything that is needed for man is needed also in some form or condition for the whole of the universe all the way to the ultimate causation. We live in a world, therefore, in which all problems break down into one grand problem. <laughs> and unless we approach the one grand problem, we cannot get too far with any part of it. Now with man, the, the governors of the man, of man are the mind and the emotions and the physical body. And these three have their private tyrannies and uh, are the causes of most of the problems that we face. These same causes in a nation produce war, bankruptcy, sedition, if abused. These three qualities in the world result in the great natural astronomical phenomena, everything from sunspots to comets. Everything is tied together with one great pattern of ethics integrity and values. Now in many of these mysteries we have only analogy to help us. We never get close enough to the problem to know exactly what it is. But we can get close enough to realize that wherever there is a problem something is wrong. And if in our lives we have problems that something that is wrong is ourselves. We have tried every way possible to push the problem onto someone else. We have tried to blame others for every mistake we make, but we are the ones that suffer. And if there is no solution to any of these problems unless we approach the whole subject more or less scientifically. We've got to approach it on the basis of a firm statement of self-responsibility and acceptance. We also have to realize that we cannot depend upon memory for the information that we need. Take, for example, the child goes to school, graduates, and goes into the world. And at this time particularly, any information that he learned uh, when he was eight or nine years old in school is liable to be completely wiped out by the time he is 16 or 18 years old. The rules he learned are obsolete before he memorizes them. The situations he thought he was fitting himself to meet no longer exist. The man who spent many years getting a career so that he could become a broker, when he gets it, finds there's so many brokers he can't get a job. All of these things represent an effort to just memorize your way into some kind of security. It can't be done. Today, memory is very, very incomplete and imperfect. The only way where memory is valuable is on the level of morality. But having no longer a security in memory, there's only one thing left to do, think. The individual has got to become capable of self-determinism. He's got to be capable of living his own life. If that is the only way he can manage the universe that is under his own skin. The ancients all realized that if the population of the world were all keep together, they would not begin to compare with the forms of life that are within the body of one human being. In other words, uh, we would not be able to divide uh, sufficiently. We would realize that perhaps a thumb has a greater population than a planet. Tiny, insignificant forms of life that do not last for a breath come by the millions, by the billions. And they all have their parts to play they are all a, a part of a great system, a great population, over which the individual, as a selfhood, is a god, a divine being, administering an empire of hundreds of billions of separate living things. Therefore, if he realizes this to a slight degree, he can become a tyrant. But very few people have reached that degree of understanding in which tyranny is possible. 
they rather remain ignorant and not knowing any part of it, they ignore it all. But we know, for instance, that just as a country will fall apart with bad leadership, our health will fall apart by the bad habits. We realize that we are, can be tyrants, we can become crazy monarchs like the past, we can kill off our subjects, we can impoverish them, we can deprive the people of our inner in kingdom of the food they need, of the protection they require, of the management they also must have. In other words, we can take from this little thing which we call the human body a mass, a grand pattern of the whole world and all the things that are involved in it. And we know that the health today tells us that unless we use certain reasonable care, we will be a bad ruler. Now the world is used of, used of, of bad, knows about all bad rulers. It knows about Genghis Khan. It knows about the conquest of Alexander and Napoleon. It knows all kinds of things about selfish people who have destroyed their empires, corrupted their world, and tortured their population. But do we realize that we may be one of them? Only that we don't know what we are doing any more than the, the despot really knows. Because we have allowed our selfishness or our ignorance or our antagonism to destroy the very life of our own bodies, to destroy millions of cells, destroy hundreds of functions, simply by a temper fit. If we keep on this way long enough, we'll be in the same way as nations on earth. It will all end in revolution. We are getting over a revolution in China. We're getting over a revolution in India. Also a revolution in all other nations of the world. We have revolutions on every hand. And most of all, we have, get, uh, we have dyspepsia which is one of the worst of our private revolutions. We have disruption because we are tired, because we pay no attention to the population of our own private world. To find out and understand this, then, begins the problem that we find in all philosophical systems. First of all, get a good government. And a good government means a proper rulership over this little world that we live in. This little world which to our visual the faculties is very tiny, but in its true substance and essence may be real vast and, uh, and uh, multiform than the galaxy. But uh, if we want and must be rulers, we should be good rulers. If we are not good rulers, we are tyrants. And if we are tyrant, we destroy our own kingdom. All this is what the people like Agrippa and Paracelsus and Damy all taught and believed. The beginning of a good world situation is an individual who learns to govern little things and who is made a righteous governor over little things shall be given rulership over greater things. The Bible tells us definitely that we must begin our rulership over little things and that those little things include mostly our own habits. To get into a condition where we can protect the body means that we are getting ready to go on to unfold a constructive program. A constructive program means that we have to not only have right ideas, but live them. Not only be convinced of truth, but apply them. And under pressure and disappointment and disillusionment, to keep right on doing that which is right. We find that every attitude which will destroy a kingdom, if brought down to the private life of an individual, will destroy health. We find that very definitely that uh, we are custodians. This body is not something that is just pushed in under the spirit to keep it while it was here. This body has been ages in evolving. It has been developed over a vast period of time to make possible the advancement of the internal life of the person. The body does not live for itself any more than humanity on the face of the earth lives for itself. They're all part of something bigger, something greater and something more important. And it is the recognition of the concatenation of greatness that we should all be working with every day. If we take these written problems that we have, we will find that 
they just as tyrants are selfish and destroy their people, so individuals are selfish and destroy their health. That wherever tyranny comes in, and in some cases tyranny is gratification of undisciplined habits, it's where we may find that the individual will not break habits which will destroy him. So he is destroyed and they blame someone else. And when this happens on a larger scale, we call it Alexander the Great. We really always are thinking of, of great people who make mistakes. But in this little mystery of ourselves, which is a very small but tremendously powerful one, this little mistake is something that can take away the health and uh, the endurance of billions of living entities within our own body. All this is something that we do when we study the human the alchemy and chemistry. We have to begin by a profound respect for the economy that makes possible the creature that we are. So we get away from the belief which we have in so many things. For instance, in law, if we don't know how to try the case, we get out the books and we read and we hope that when we read we will get the answer. When the individual is sick we make an examination but the examination is read according to the experiences of the past. When we prescribe a drug it is based upon some preparation which we have found in the catalog of drugs and hope to God it's the right one. And it is the same in politics. When we elect, elect a politician, we go to the Romans or we go to the Greeks or even the Chinese to find out just how it should be done. And we get generally a government of, of theory and lack of practice. And the Greeks discover that without disciplining ourselves, we have elected an undisciplined body to govern us. So that all the way along, every time an emergency arises, it is a, de a determined fact that we have to be prepared for it. Now, how do we prepare ourselves for these facts? First of all, we must prepare by a series of moral lessons. When we elect someone to public office, we hope we will get the individual who is best qualified. When we try to make decisions of our own, we hope that we are in a condition to make a just and intelligent decision, which may or may not be true, usually is not. So we have to prepare ourselves for responsibility. It has been talked about the importance of having a university for the education of diplomats and, and those in heavy political positions, that they should be trained particularly for that. Well, you can say the same thing. The entity that lives in our body should have the proper administration and it should have the watchful care of enlightened electors who know exactly what they are doing and are doing that which is best for all concerned. The uh, experiences which we will recognize, you know, as coming partly at least uh, through memory have their value, but they are only nudging us to go and trying to get us to go on to something better, something more useful, something more wise. We may take an example from one of these, but we can't leave it there. We have to go on. Now we're going to try to go on into the next century. And we're going to try to take this human body probably for as many more years as possible. Those in younger years have a good chance of a reasonable length of future unless they destroy themselves. A country has a good chance for future unless its government destroys it. In all cases, wherever there is imbalance, wherever there is Lack of ethics, take this begin political, psychological, physical. So we have to watch constantly, or we will not even survive long enough to make the corrections we'd like to make. So we're going now into the study of this body to find out a little more about it, a little more about how it works and why it works. And we have a body which is a kingdom, or an empire, or a republic, or a commonwealth and can even become a communistic state. All of these things are possible, and Plato reminds us that all of them are equally meritorious if they are administered with intelligent justice. 
There is no bad form of government. There is only a misuse of governmental power. Therefore, no matter what the form may be, it will work if it is honest. No matter how gorgeous and elegant and modern and up-to-date it is, it will not work if it is dishonest. So we start with those kind of problems, and we say these all are applicable to health. They're applicable to the problems that come to us in our daily uh, living. They have to do with our gradual and intelligent control of our own functions. It was one of the ancients who gave us the law of the 24-inch rule. The rule of three uh, division of a day. A day of 24 hours divided into three sections of eight hours each. This was the measure of the work of the individual. And these are three hours, are three, are eight hours for work, eight hours for repose, and eight, eight hours for self-improvement. The individual should set aside his problems in such a way that each of the divisions of, the, of his lot, a day contributes to his wisdom, his happiness, his security, and his health. If he breaks any of these rules, he is breaking the basic path. He is breaking the, breaking the foundation of enlightened government. He is breaking the rules of the world in which he lives. Now these are 24 hours of each day. What are we doing with them now? Well, if we're employed, we're working at something we probably do not greatly enjoy. Maybe we enjoy it a little. And then we go home from that to the next hour, eight hours, and the chances are that most of those will be spent in front of a television, which itself is not particularly enjoyable. And the other eight hours will be one thing or another, trying to sleep, trying to get something else done, attempting to go on with other activities, or simply giving up in despair. Maybe doing a little physical exercise just to keep it up. So we have to start in to put a regulation into everything in order that we produce a body capable of giving intelligent commands itself. The government is like the British Parliament. It is, consists of the House of Lords. And the Lords in these cases are the selves. So your Lord in the government is what you like, what you believe in, what you intend to do anyway. It represents the authority that you have because you are the person in the body. The House of Commons is the, uh, the body itself. And in most of the old kingdoms, the, uh, the commons rule although not always. The House of Commons means representation by the whole. Uh, in other words, in the human body, the House of Commons is composed of every living cell in that body. The House of Lords is the part that has to do with the body what it pleases. But the Commons is the house that has the right to be protected from all abuse by the overlords. If the overlords abuse the body, it will be sick. If they, if they refuse to contribute to the well-being of a community, the community is sick. So the uh, beginning of our understanding is to recognize the physical body as a political empire, as a moral world, as a religious sphere, as a chemical and physical body. All these different things are in the body. And to have a healthy body, you've got to keep the rules. Whenever a tyrant rules the body, we have dissipation and death. Where a fanatic rules the body, we may have all kinds of tortures and starvation, privation, and self-sacrifice for too much. Whenever economics guards the body, we'll be in trouble all the time. Where if we go on to some particular profession, if we go into law, then that God controls the body. Everything we do, we use parts of the physical body's resources to do it. And wherever these resources are abused, we have terrible trouble. Because finally, there's something else that we have not yet much considered. And that is, that we will again in our discussions later, but I'll bring it in just for a moment. 
and beyond the body and beyond what it has to do and, uh, and beyond the controls which it exercises behind and beyond the mind and the memory is an infinite integrity which cannot be compromised it will go on forever when we break the laws of that then we are in definite danger and we break the laws of the greater when we break the laws of the lesser for these laws operate in every human body in the stomach in the spleen they re relate to every phase we have but behind all of the others phases is the immutability of the simple fact that it must be right or it is wrong that there can be no compromise between integrity and self-indulgence. There can be no substitute for the recognition that right is right. Now, it sounds, of course, as though right might be terrible that way. Right sounds like a police state, but it isn't. Right has never been obtrusive. You never know... right until you do wrong. Then it comes in on you with all its power. Therefore, right is not a tyranny. Right is a simple action in conformity with the rules of the game of life. It is the keeping the rules and enjoying the result of good citizenship. The moment the individual becomes a bad citizen, then the laws of the eternal nature come in upon him with all their destructive and miserable reactions but they do not come in unless we break them. We do not know of evil while we do good. We do not know of ignorance while we are naturally wise. All the artificial achievements which we vanish, which we image too highly, slip away. But the integrities remain forever. And those who keep in harmony with these integrities live at peace with themselves. And this is the beginning of living in peace with the world. Now we take the human body and we say that it is a regulator of all the affairs of nature. We study the human body in terms of ancient philosophy and we find that even very physiologists were pretty well acquainted with this, with this particular problem. They knew, for instance, <coughs> all about the twelve wise men on the top of the mountain. They realized the twelve apostles, all these things, and they realized that there are twelve convolutions of the brain in the ancient mountain on the top of the great hill, that the mysterious world of Brahma is on the shoulders. In the tabernacle of the Jews, it is laid out, instead of rising, it retires into the depths. Here again, you have the three steps of retirement, and at the end, in the end, in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant consists of angels with their wings meeting over the mercy seat. These wings of the angels are again the convolutions of the brain. And between them rises the flame of the Shekinah's glory. For when the Lord came to bring messengers to his priests and his prophets, he appeared as a great light upon the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the third manticle of the brain. The uh, glory of the Lord is the flame that blazes out between the pituitary body and the pineal gland. Every part of the philosophical and religious mystery is actually performed in the uh, secret parts of the human body. We find also that the human body, with the brain that's above it, the spine, which is the whip of the small sword, the 33 segments of the spine are the 33 years of the life of Christ, and of the 33 years which required to complete the temple. Also, these small, small filaments of spinal cord at the base are referred to as the whip of small cords with which Jesus cast the money lenders out of the temple. All of these things have their physical, bodily equi equivalent and are perfectly balanced. We know that the, the diaphragm supports the Mount Moriah on which stands the Temple of Solomon. We know that the, the vagus nerve is the great river of life. We know all these things. And, uh, for instance, we know that there is the anatomy now refers to certain small growths at the base of the skull at the back 
as the pyramids. It knows that the outer cover of the brain is the dura mater, the, the, the rough or strong mother, and the inner covering is the pia mater, or the, the very subtle and gentle mother. All these terms are used in anatomy. Now, every one of them can be tied back to some religious facts because they pertain to facts and circumstances that are unchanging. Everything that is inside of us is a miniature of everything that is outside of us. And when we begin to realize that, we also realize that all the false glories, all the crimes and all the corruption of nasty physical enlargement of the bad habits that are continually fluttering around in our own subjective lives. So we try to work with all of these problems, knowing that the first problem we have is this physical body, that we want to live in it as long as we can and as helpfully and happily as possible, and that to do this we must do what we can. No one will do it perfectly, but we'll do what we can to make it not only a useful body, but dedicate its use to some purpose to be on the wasting of time, that there is always something to be done, that a body should be built in the mother's womb, should go through all of this mysterious transformation, pass through all the kingdoms of nature in miniature, and finally become born into this world in great pain and travail. But all this would happen. Then it should start and grow up and go through all the problems of becoming an adult out of the stress and pressures of our modern environment. And what does it do when it has accomplished everything? It takes on narcotics and kills itself. This is not what was intended. And there is no way in which this type of thing can ever produce forgiveness of sin because it is not a forgivable sin. The sin is very different. This is simply an individual who actually doesn't know or doesn't believe that he has any purpose in life other than to try to stay here in some way as long as he's comfortable. These things have to, have to be built in. And why do we say they have to be built in? Because they are part of the science of, of the human being, which means they are part of the science of medicine, that they are the part of physiology, psychology, anthropology. They are part of all the systems of work that have to do with the well-being of the individual. And every day today, there are new problems created. These problems probably will not be corrected by use of memory. They will be corrected only by the use of the mind in a proper way to solve the difficulty which have resulted from using the mind in the wrong way. It must be used as it was intended. So we find health not to be divided from wisdom. And the functions of the body are one with our love for God and our fellow man. There is no way in which hate can ever produce anything but trouble. And while we hope that it's going to trouble somebody else, it always finally troubles us. So little by little, we become aware of psychical or physiological uh, the mysteries relating to the body. We realize that it is something that can be incredibly important that we can produce in this world leaders who will protect us and guide us and help us all to attain the fullness of our manifestation. It can produce families of people who really understand each other and are willing to sacrifice together for the common good. It will produce those who are willing to labor for peace and suffer as necessary to overcome the dissonances of war. All things can happen if we release, release into manifestation the basic potentials of the human being. And uh, to do this, we have to realize that we are constantly being injured in even the simplest things we want to do right. It isn't always possible for us to know what is right. We can only know what we are told unless we do some thinking. If we are willing to hope that somebody who claims to be an authority can speak for us, then we have to take the chances. It's exactly like the probabilities of finding a good bookkeeper or a good doctor. All these things have to be either done by ourselves or else they have to be delegated. And if they are delegated, we have to expect a certain amount of imperfection or incompletion. We, ultimately, everyone must leave his own life into the good world we all hope for.
In the meantime, however, it is necessary to recognize the basic facts of life. I had a letter not long ago from someone who is trying to improve by the use of new and religious ideals now current and wants to know if certain groups are legitimate and certain groups are telling the truth and if it's all well in the religious world. Well, it's practically impossible to answer a lot of questions of that nature. No one knows, really, how good anything is except the person who creates it. If the individual who creates something does so for the common good, it will probably be good. If he will create it for the good of himself or profit, it will probably not be good. These are rules that we all have to face. Now, we also have to owe something. We owe something to the earth beneath our feet to help this body. We owe something to all the kingdoms of nature that give us food and give us health at all times. We owe something to all the different levels of society which give us protection or give us opportunities. We owe a great deal to those who help us to achieve a good education or develop good habits. Everywhere we owe a lot to life, and that means that we have that debt that must always be paid. If we accept life and do not pay the debt, we will reap death. This is all part of the physical world. It is a world that you can study geographically with its mountains and its streams, its lakes and its valleys. It is also the psychological globe or world, which we can say is made up of moods, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, customs. All these things are part of a social or civilized world government or world life. Each of these things has to be given consideration. And we could hope, sincerely, that each individual who really wants to improve will give some thought and some effort to correcting the imperfections of his own nature. Not because we want to hurt him or worry him or we want to torture him, but simply we want to save him from the inevitable suffering that comes from willfulness or ignorance. We have now better knowledge of many things than we had before. But we also have developed a strange and almost uncontrollable abandon economically and socially. We live only to spend, and in order to do this, we must steal. And if we take the other man's money, it's exactly like taking his food. For if it is his life and its only support and only security, we have no right to make this impossible to him. The human body has to be at peace. Now, where does the human body most often get sick? Well, I have been told, in fact, my old friend Vandaline Adams, the astrologer, told me once, that sickness and death always begin with the intestines. That, it's, that nearly everything that destroys us is some kind of an indigestion. It can be a religious indigestion that makes us a fanatic. It can be a social indignation or indigestion uh, that makes us antisocial. It can be almost anything, but it is something that has to do with a digestion and assimilation. It means that we have taken in something that cannot be properly handled by the body, that we are not giving the body its due care and attention, that if we do not take care of it, it will start to disintegrate, and uh, when it wants to go, it will make, make the intestinal tract a living hell while we're still in this world can be a very serious and terrible thing. So we have to prepare. Now, if we want to keep out of hell morally, according to our friends, the theologians, we've got to keep the good words. And if we want to stay out of the hell of intestinal disintegration, we've got to watch what we eat, how we eat, and when. We also must always realize that all food must be taken with a gentle spirit. No one... <laughs> should eat when he's angry, eat when he's upset, eat when he is not hungry, all these kind of things. But he should so live that about three times a day or thereabouts, he will be happy enough to eat normally. If he does that, he will probably have a pretty good, in, a pretty good digestive system. But everything we do goes right back to an analogy or a simile in the body itself. We find that we are also 
composed of creatures that have reaction to what we eat. Now, it, not, it should never be forgotten that every food element has a dispositional factor. To a certain measure, we are what we eat. Not entirely. But perhaps all forms of food have moral and psychological reactions. And a many an individual who thinks he's dying of a bad psychosis is simply dying of frustrated indigestion. All the different things that we have to do are very simple. Now, the ancients pointed out that the more money we have and the more luxurious we are, the more likely we are to be sick. Because the moment we become luxury-loving, we are in serious trouble. And uh, Rand went to a Greek philosopher and said, Master, if I was to damn a man, what could I do that would most destroy him? And the philosopher thought for a couple of minutes. Well, if you wish to do the worst thing you can do, him, tell him you hope that his sons will, love, will live luxuriously. Because if so, they will be a disgrace to you for the rest of their lives. So all these things go back to the body. They go back to the physical structure with which we are endowed. They tell us something that we should watch and listen. They, we cannot solve these problems with stomach pills. We cannot get away from these mistakes. We cannot get away from the danger of alcoholism. We cannot get over uh, the disabilities of cigarette smoking. We cannot possibly get over narcotic addiction. And we can't get over all forms of rich and indigestible foods. These things are destroying not just us, but imagine now that we became infinitely small and we're located somewhere in the southwest corner of the liver. It's a funny place to be, but it'll do for the moment. And being in the place of the liver and being a one millionth of an inch in diameter. And we are there, and uh, this is our homeland. This is the land for which our fathers died, this little piece in the corner of the liver. And in the midst of the fact that we're getting along pretty well, the family is uh, secure, and we're just getting down to the point where life will be pleasant, suddenly there's a terrible agitation. An earthquake has struck the liver. Now, what caused the earthquake? Well, overindulgence. There may be this little psychosis of the liver thrown in. But all of a sudden, this little being, everything that's important is taken away from it. It has no longer the power to live. It has no longer the power to do anything. Its world has been destroyed by somebody who ate too much. And who is his God? He had no way of resisting this. But all of a sudden, the power that fashioned him destroys him. And he gets very little not to understand. So all he can do, if he can do anything, is to weep and fade away. Now, in another world, that's such as we're in the big one, like now. All right, instead of being in the right corner of the liver, you could be in the center of Armenia a few weeks ago, when a great earthquake came through and destroyed better than 30,000 people. This, which seems to be an act of nature, nobody knows what to do about it. Uh, they, they, don't, they just think it's one of those things that happens. We don't have to think that. Because long ago, back in Alexandria, when they were studying all these types of things, they realized that earthquakes do not come just simply out of indifference in nature or accidents that can't be described. Just as the individual destroyed uh, the little bit of power of the liver to take care of that little cell, so earthquakes are acts of moral reaction to a great body suffering from sickness. The, uh, the planet can be sick. It can have a broken heart. It probably has. It can have dyspepsia. It, it can have angina pectoris. It can have neurosis. It can become in completely involved in some mysterious uh, psychic stress pattern. It can become mentally disturbed, emotionally disturbed. It can have anything happen to it that can happen to a human body. Because after all, it's all one pattern. Well, only degree of magnitude, not any change in the actual pattern itself. So as long as we are bad to the body, individual, 
we will have those problems. And as long as humanity is bad to the body, the earth on which it lives, the time will come, as they said in India, when the Great Mother will shake us again from the face of her body. All these things are part of a pattern. And the human body is, as Paracelsus says, the little book in which we can see happening around us and within us practically every faction and function that we observe today. It is definitely a part of our inevitable that we should see the analogy of the great hermetic axiom, as above, so below, as in the great, so in the less, as in the upper, so in the lower. All these things are all one quality moving through the different levels and layers of culture, civilization, anatomy, physiology, and function. All these things are part of one pattern. You could break the heart of an individual and he'll die slowly from a broken heart. You can break the heart of a nation and it will die. You can make all these things work on all these levels. You can see the cause of crime. You can see all the different reasons why things go wrong when you begin to realize that we are all part of a living organism. Various size models of the same thing. This was discovered probably 10,000 years ago. It was known in Egypt at least 5,000 years ago. And uh, it is still that way. But to us, that is no longer uh, a fact. It is simply one of these uh, of the mysterious faculties or function uh, which we simply call memory. We have only the memory of it. We knew that it happened in Egypt. We knew that it happened in Atlantis. We knew that it was screamed by the Sibylline oracles. But that doesn't make much difference. We do not know the real actions and functions. We do not really know what we have to do to get over it. Well, Paracelsus says it's only not so complicated. The only way to get over the consequences of our mistakes is to stop making them. There is no way we will ever have them blessed and continue to make them. If, we, if our world is in trouble, it can only remain in trouble until we correct the trouble. Now, we are not going to correct the trouble by writing books on the trouble. We're not going to do it by quoting the elders who wrote on the trouble. We're not going to get it from the studies of trouble of a thousand, two thousand years ago. They may give us a hint, but that's not the problem. The problem is to stop the trouble we're making right now. And we're going to have to use new ways of doing it. The answer to the problem of human regeneration cannot be taken directly from the past. It can be understood or sensed in terms of the past. But the answer must be now. It must be in terms of the immediate situation. We have had all kinds of troubles in the past. We've had wars in the past. But this is the first time we've had an atomic war. And that changes the whole pattern, requiring an entirely new group of solutions. It's, no, it's not going to be possible to do what they did in, one long ago, arbitrate a war, and you know, sit around a table and sign the peace track. Now it's going to take more. We're gradually approaching the danger point in which there is no way of stopping the mistake except to stop making it. And that is the thing we're all fighting against. We're fighting against the curbing of our luxuries, our expenditures, our jealousies, our affections, or our hatreds. We want them to be all left alone so that we can do as we like. Every nation that has done it that way has died. But the fact that it died doesn't mean that we could save ours simply by copying the laws of the other one. There is a separate factor every time because there is an evolutionary movement here. Things are moving. Therefore, all solutions must be moving solutions. They cannot be based upon some static point two or three thousand years ago. They have to be used in a new way. We can take the morality, we can take the ethics, we can take everything that is useful out of the past. But in each case, there must be a positive, immediate action of our own to take care of the situation. We must make a move that no man has ever moved, done before if we are to solve a problem 
that no man has ever faced before. All this causes us to find it very interesting, useful, and important to study the human body, to realize what it is composed of, and to realize that we have here a living model of the greater world. A living model that challenges us. A model that gives each of us an examination every term in school paper. A model that answers our question and tells us the truth whether we want to hear it or not. This, this the body then becomes man's most immediate agent for improvement, for the resolution of problems. After all, we don't know this, but we may as well face it. The physical problems, after all, are really the easiest to solve. We have much more that goes beyond the physical. This is just the first step. But if we get this first step right, the further inspiration of the achievement will help us a long way to the next step. As Gautama Buddha pointed out, the first step to salvation is the most difficult. It is the first step because we do not know where we are going. But once we make a step forward and discover that there is solid earth under our feet, that we are moving in a direction, that we are gradually overcoming the hindrances that prevent us from doing things well. Buddhism calls all these mistakes hindrances. They are all things that delay. What we call the mistakes of the day are delays. Everything is a delay. It is something that prevents the proper motion of things. A delay or a hindrance is something, an object or condition, which stands between us and peace, stands between us and the fulfillment of that which is right and good. If, therefore, we are able to overcome these hindrances physically, we will then find that we have a physical foundation upon which to raise the next problem that we have to face. And that is the uh, most, the, uh, we'll say, the uh, glandular vitality of the human body. The human body goes on up and up and up until it vanishes. But the first thing it has to do is to establish a basic foundation. The moment it does that, then it goes into the glandular system, the autonomic non nervous system, the cerebrospinal nervous system, into all the organs, and we want to start and work with those, at least a little, in this series of lectures. It is to prove that all the way we have a living text that will never tell us that we're right until we are right now that will never bring health to the sick unless we do that which is necessary now. While Nostradamus was a medical officer of Salon in France, there was a bad outbreak of diarrhea in the country. And uh, he suggested that it was probably caused by a swamp in the outskirts of the city, which was known to be uh, have a bad smell and to be surrounded by strange insects and creatures. He thinks it should have been drained. He wanted the people to drain the swamp. Well, they appreciated his requirements, requirements. They thought he was the most wonderful man in the world, and that they would take it up with the city council. The city council did nothing. Therefore, Nostradamus took up his little box, a pack on his old mule, and rode out of the city. They, his advice was priceless. They loved him devoutly. But when he asked them to drain the county swamp, no one no, nothing doing. The swamp had always been there. So when we say to somebody, you have to drain that temper you have, it's getting you in trouble. You lose a friend right on the spot. They may know that they need to take but they don't want to be reminded. So we hope always that we will be able to achieve health, peace of mind, world uh, balance and equilibrium, and overcoming faults. Uh, poverty and crime without changing our own conduct. <clears throat> Any physician can tell you that you can't get over the effects of over-drugging without giving up the drug. And we cannot get over some bad habits until we change the habits. Otherwise, the comfort of being sick from the habits will continue. And we will keep right on until we slip off into that quietude which will give us some time to thought before we build up another body. But it takes good many bodies generally to get to the individual to say to himself, it takes me 20, 21 years to get this body functioning. I have to get up and be born. I have to cry. I have to be weaned. I have to gradually go to the primary school or kindergarten. 
And I had to go through the experiences of social adjustment with my peers, the other members of school. I had to get over the younger sicknesses. I had to do the tea thing. I had to do all kinds of things. And finally, I had to get educated enough to get a job. And I was 20 years old by that time. I had all that work behind me, all this problem. And then what do we do with it? Well, one so a person told me they thought after all that work they ought to spend the rest of their life playing. But it doesn't work that way. What they really have to do when they get that type of background is spend their life doing something that makes all this misery worthwhile. If they don't do that, then the misery will continue instead of the life. So we have everywhere in the world today people who want to live better than they are living. But very few of them want to give up their animosity. They do not want to make the changes which, in a case of sickness, would help them to restore health. But they, they are sick. There are all levels of sickness. And until each level is mastered, corrected, or understood, and if necessary, apologized for, there is no probability of improvement. So uh, these philosophers, the Rosicrucians and the Alchemists and the Kabbalists, had this realization that you cannot depend entirely upon memory for anything. You have to take what you remember of the past, put it into the test of now. The past helps, but does not complete. Everything that has to be solved must be solved by the individual growing now. Now, there's nothing in this growth pattern that says he has to be perfect. Because of 10% improvement would so change his life, he'd never recognize it. But it is true that he has to change himself. Uh, tradition, example, knowledge of the past may give him some of the instruments to work with. But he must you take those instruments, adapt them to the pressures of the moment, and live clean and clear now. And that is the only way he can get over the problem. There is no way in which he can substitute economic uh, success for any major form of ailment. There was a man up in Alaska who got, who got, who got a lot of gold after gold strikes up there. And of course, having a lot of money, he wined and dined himself to the point that he came to his deathbed. And they told him it was only hope, and that is if he went out to Mayo Brothers, maybe they could save him. So off he goes to Mayo Brothers, they work on him for a while, catch him up pretty well, and they tell him that he can he'll make quite a little more mileage off this old body if he will live principally on bread and milk, if he keeps away from all rich food. So he goes back up to Alaska again, and he's so happy that he's going to have a little further lease on life that he puts on a big banquet for all his friends and dies the next morning. <laughs> now, this is a rather abrupt answer. But hundreds and thousands of people are doing this very thing just a little more slowly. So uh, the, when the, another thing is important. If you understand the mysteries of the human being, the body, the mind, and the soul, you can also, in this way, gain a very full understanding of practically every external phenomena of nature. You will find that in becoming master of yourself, you become master of all worlds. And the fact that you're the master of all worlds <coughs> is proven by the simple fact that under no conditions will you allow yourself to corrupt any world. That your world management or ownership of it shall be for its good and for the fulfillment of the noblest parts of yourself. The world is gradually becoming healthy, mentally, immorally, physically, by keeping the simple rules of now will find that he can then derive from the past certain principles that are useful to him. But by his own constructive, creative, enlightened thinking, he must make those rules applicable to the conditions of today. If he can do this, all will be well. That's it.